Hello, thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Into the Killing. As we've mentioned in most episodes, we'd love to hear from you if you have a case you want to cover on Into the Killing or one of our YouTube channels, Criminally Listed or Paranormally Listed. To suggest a case, go to the Suggest a Case page on our website, criminallylisted.com. For this week's episode, we're going back to October 1979. On October 1st, 1979, Pope John Paul II arrived in Boston, Massachusetts. Ronjero Josef Yotova, he was elected as Pope in September 1978. This was the second time a Pope had visited the United States. Fifteen years earlier, in October 1965, Pope Paul VI had visited the United States. He was the first Pope to visit the Western Hemisphere. Pope John Paul II spent seven days in the United States. He addressed the United Nations General Assembly on the 40th anniversary of the beginning of World War II. He condemned concentration camps and torture. On the last day of his trip, the Pope visited Washington, D.C. He was greeted at the White House by President Jimmy Carter. He was the first Pope to visit the White House. Carter and the Pope spoke in the Oval Office. Pope John Paul II visited the United States another six times. He died in 2005. He was canonized in 2014 as Pope St. John Paul II. In 1979, Universal Studios and Walt Disney Productions were trying to stop Sony and RCA from selling VCRs. In court, they argued that recording shows and movies on television was a violation of copyright laws. But a U.S. District Judge ruled that such recording is permissible under the Copyright Acts of 1909 and 1976. In 1981, the decision was reversed on appeal. The case made its way to the United States Supreme Court. On January 17, 1984, the initial ruling was upheld because it was considered fair use. As a result, the sales of VCRs flourished in the 1980s. On October 14, 1979, Wayne Gretzky scored his first NHL goal while playing for the Edmonton Oilers. It would be the first of many. Gretzky, known as the Great One, holds the record for most goals and most points. In 1,487 games, he scored 894 goals and he got 1,963 assists, totaling 2,857 points. He's the only player to score over 200 points in a season. He did this four times. Gretzky also won four Stanley Cups. When he retired in 1999, he held 61 records. After school ended on October 15, 1979, eight-year-old Kenneth Conrick went by Kenny, was walking to his babysitter's home. Kenny was in the third grade and he lived with his mother, Myrna Conrick, and her boyfriend, Ethan Wosley, in Gary, Indiana. Kenny was walking with his friend, Ralph. They stopped by the home of 18-year-old Damon Bisler. Bisler gave them some popcorn. Then the two boys started walking again. Shortly afterward, Ralph broke off from Kenny. Kenny was going to his babysitter's, who lived a few houses down from the home that he shared with his mother and her live-in boyfriend. The babysitter was 15-year-old Tavis Glendez. When Kenny's mother, Myrna, came to pick up Kenny at Glendez's home, she was shocked to learn that Kenny wasn't there. He never made it there after school. Myrna and her boyfriend started a frantic search around the neighborhood for Kenny but no one knew where he was. Myrna called the police, who immediately started a search for the boy. An intense sense of panic arose in Myrna, perhaps, if possible, more than a typical mother of a missing child. She understood the pain and anguish of losing a child. Two years earlier, on July 22, 1977, Myrna and her sons, five-year-old Kenny and four-year-old Kevin, were visiting Lake Eliza in Porter Township, Indiana. Tragically, four-year-old Kevin drowned. Now Myrna was living a new nightmare. The police questioned Myrna's boyfriend, Ethan Wosley, whom she had been dating for about a year. Wosley said he had been home all day and Kenny didn't come home. He claimed that he and Kenny had a good relationship, but not everyone thought so. Kenny told his friends that Wosley was mean to him. Wosley admitted to spanking Kenny with a two-inch belt as a form of punishment. Wosley was also a less-than-ideal partner for Myrna. Wosley had served in Vietnam and he had seen some awful things. He had mental health problems, he was an alcoholic, 
and had problems holding down a job. Also, the police had been called to their home because of a domestic dispute. But Wasley swore he had nothing to do with the boy's disappearance. He thought that Kenny was probably hiding out somewhere and he would be coming home soon. The police then questioned the babysitter, 15-year-old Tavis Galendez. Galendez said that he and Kenny got along well. Glendez was surprised when he didn't show up. Glendez had just started on paper route and Kenny was excited to go out with him to deliver the newspapers. While Glendez didn't come across as a child killer, the police learned things about him they considered disturbing. On at least two occasions after he and Kenny argued, he ditched Kenny. One time a police officer found Kenny alone in the baseball field. Glendez also apparently showed Kenny pornographic photos, which is something some pedophiles do to groom their victims. Another person the police talked to was one of the last people to see Kenny before he went missing. That was his neighbor, 18-year-old Damon Bisler. Bisler was friendly with everyone in the neighborhood, especially the children. But he claimed he didn't know what happened to Kenny. The police found nothing that connected him to the disappearance. Unfortunately, 24 hours passed without Kenny being found. The police now believed that they were looking for a body. We're just going to take a break from this episode to bring you a word from our wonderful sponsor, Babbel. One of the most exciting things about the new year is that you have no idea what adventure is in store for you. From new travel experiences to new jobs or picking up new skills, there's no better way to prepare for 2023 than by learning a new language with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can feel confident no matter where the new year takes you. I've been learning Dutch with Babbel, and the coolest thing happened to me the other day. I've always loved punk rock from all over the world. It never really mattered to me if I understood the lyrics, because I was more interested in the music and the energy of the bands. One band I've listened to on and off for years is Hyder Rosias from the Netherlands, who sings some of their songs in Dutch. I was listening to a mix yesterday, and one of their Dutch language songs came on. As it played, I realized I understood what they were singing. My mind was blown. Of course, learning a new language comes in handy in more ways than just understanding song lyrics. It will help you when you travel. It may give you a leg up when applying for a job or a promotion, and it will help keep your brain sharp. And trust me, if I can learn a new language, anyone can. Babbel's lessons are only about 10 minutes long, and after 3 weeks, you can start having real-life conversations. There are 14 languages you can learn. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. One thing that makes their lessons really effective is that they were created by 150 language experts and it's voiced by real native speakers and not computers. Other language learning apps use AI to create and voice their lessons. But Babbel does have great technology, like their speech recognition technology, which helps improves your pronunciations and accent. While their classes are short and fun, it's not the only way to learn on Babbel. They also have podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even classes. You also have nothing to lose by trying Babbel. They have a 20-day money-back guarantee. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash listed. That's babbel.com slash listed for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Over the next week, Mirna spent most of her time searching for her son. When she wasn't out searching, she spent a lot of time in his bedroom. She noticed two library books that were checked out from the school library. She decided to return them to the school library. That's when she learned that the books were checked out the same day Kenny went missing. If the books were in his bedroom, that meant he had to come home to drop them off. But Mirna's boyfriend, Ethan Wosley, was home and he swore that Kenny didn't come home that day. So this instantly moved Wosley into the prime suspect spot. Another problem was that Wasley didn't have an alibi. He should have been at work that day, but he had taken the day off because he was going to a job interview. But the police were never able to confirm that the job interview was real. Wasley said he only left the house that afternoon to look for Kenny. He thought Kenny might have come home then, dropped off his books, and left again. The police thought that Wasley might have been home drinking. Then Kenny came home and said something Wasley didn't like. Wasley snapped and killed Kenny. 
but Wesley was admin. He had nothing to do with Kenny's disappearance. He volunteered for a polygraph exam, and he passed. Then the police made a crucial discovery. It turned out that the school librarian had put the wrong date on the checkout card in the books. So Kenny could have taken the books out the day before he went missing and brought them home then. That means he may not have made it home on the day he went missing. It also meant that Ethan Wosley might have been telling the truth. Wosley also appeared to be upset by Kenny's disappearance and he had helped in the searches. He was moved to the prime suspect spot, but he remained a person of interest. On October 28, 1979, 13 days after Kenny went missing, his body was found in a wooded area about three blocks from his home. He was naked, except for his socks. His left ankle was tied to a tree with a string from his jacket. There was a stab wound in his chest, and another cord from his jacket was wrapped around his throat. He had bruises and cuts on his body. The medical examiner determined he had been asphyxiated to death. A sharp stick caused the stab wound. The cuts were from a broken bottle. The cuts and bruises indicated that Kenny had put up a big fight before he was killed. Because of the level of decomposition, the medical examiner did not know if Kenny had been sexually assaulted, but the police believe that the murder was sexually motivated. That's because semen was found on his coat. Myrna understandably took the news hard. Both of her sons had tragically died under the age of seven. She was now left with nothing. The police, many of whom had children, were committed to solving Kenny's murder. With the discovery of the body, it turned up new leads. The police interviewed people who lived near the wooded area where the body was found. One person said that after sundown on the day of the murder, she saw an older teenager or a man in his early 20s running from the area. Even though it was dark, she said she got a good look at his face and swore she could pick him out of a photo lineup. So the police showed her several photo lineups. She picked out a man named Raymond Yarker. Yarker lived about 10 blocks from Kenny's home. He had a long criminal record and served time in prison, but he was out of prison when Kenny was killed. The police interviewed Yarker. He said he had previously been in the woods, but it had been years since he had been in there. He also had an alibi for the time of the murder. He was drinking beer with his brother. He said that the witness was causing trouble for him because she didn't like him because of his criminal record. The police checked with Yarker's brother and he confirmed the alibi. The police continued to investigate Kenny's murder. They talked to a crossing guard who said they saw Kenny on the afternoon of the murder. He was with a boy delivering newspapers. The police thought it was the babysitter, Tavis Galendez. But the witness said it was a different boy, 16-year-old David Bowen. The investigators learned that a year before the murder, Bowen had brutally beaten and sexually assaulted a 9-year-old boy. The boy's mother chose not to press charges because Bowen got therapy. So the investigators knew Bowen was capable of violence against young boys. The police interviewed David Bowen. He said he didn't remember talking to Kenny on the day of the murder. Bowen's parents agreed to have him do a polygraph exam. During the exam, Bowen became upset and stormed out of the room. The questions he did answer regarding Kenny's murder showed signs of deception. The police wanted Bowen to take another polygraph exam. But on the advice of his lawyer, he refused to sit down for another polygraph exam. The police eventually investigated over 100 persons of interest. But no arrests were made, and the case went cold. Kenny's family began to lose hope that the case would ever be solved. His aunt told the television program, Unusual Suspects, that they thought they would die and go to heaven. When they got there, Kenny would tell them who killed him. 26 long years went by. In 2005, a new team of investigators opened the case. In 1979, when the murder was committed, the most watched TV shows were 60 Minutes, Three's Company, and That's Incredible. 
Worldwide, the biggest movies were the family drama, Kramer vs. Kramer, then the horror classic, The Amityville Horror, and finally, the sports drama, Rocky II. 1979's Academy Award for Best Picture went to the Vietnam War drama, The Deer Hunter. The three biggest songs were My Sharona by The Knack, Bad Girls by Donna Summers, Lay Freak by Chick. The Grammy for Album of the Year went to 52nd Street by Billy Joel, while Song of the Year and Record of the Year were awarded to What Fools Believe by Kenny Loggins and Michael McDonald. New consumer products you could buy in 1979 were the Black & Decker Dustbuster, the board game Guess Who, and the Sony Walkman. As for food, Happy Meals were introduced by McDonald's, High Nut Cheerios were available for the first time, and if you wanted nachos, Tostitos were available in stores. 26 years later, in 2005, the three biggest movies in the world were all parts of huge franchises. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, and the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. The Academy Award for Best Picture went to the boxing drama, Million Dollar Baby. In 2005, the three biggest songs were We Belong Together by Mariah Carey, Hollaback Girl by Gwen Stefani, and Let Me Love You by Mario. At the Grammys, Album of the Year went to U2 for their 11th studio album, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. Song of the Year also went to U2 for their song, Sometimes You Can't Make It on Your Own. Record of the Year was Green Day's Boulevard of Broken Dreams, which beat out the other modern classics, Gold Digger by Kanye West, Hollaback Girl by Gwen Stefani, Feel Good Inc. by Gorillaz, and We Belong Together by Mariah Carey. Products released in 2005 were the iPod Shuffle and Nano, Tag Body Spray, and the Xbox 360. In 2005, Burger King introduced their chicken fries, and people were getting tipsy on the caffeinated drinks for Loco, and Coca-Cola Zero Sugar was available for the first time. In 2005, the investigators learned that the evidence from Kenny's case had been stored extremely well. So the evidence was checked for DNA. The investigators found DNA from an unknown male on his jacket and on the string wrapped around his throat. The police thought it would just be a matter of entering the DNA into the FBI's combined DNA index system. They thought that someone who committed that brutal of a murder wouldn't just stop after killing Kenny. But they were shocked when they didn't find a match. So the police decided to go back and look at their most promising suspects. They had five people they couldn't clear. One was Ethan Wosley, Myrna's boyfriend at the time of the murder. He had mental health problems, he was an alcoholic, and he was heavy handed when it came to disciplining Kenny. He also didn't have a solid alibi for the time of the murder. A second person of interest was Damon Bisler. He was one of the last people to see Kenny alive. He had invited Kenny and his friend inside his home for popcorn. Another suspect was Tavis Glendez, the babysitter. He didn't have an alibi. Also, he had a history of mistreating Kenny. Glendez also apparently showed Kenny pornographic photos, which is something some pedophiles do to groom their victims. A fourth suspect was Raymond Yarker. Yarker had a criminal record, and a witness said she saw him leaving the wooded area where Kenny was murdered on the night he was killed. However, he had an alibi, but it wasn't a good one. He said he was drinking with his brother, but the police knew his brother could have lied for him. The fifth and final suspect was David Bowen. A witness said she saw him talking to Kenny shortly before his death. A year earlier, Bowen had beat and sexually assaulted a nine-year-old boy. Bowen took a polygraph exam, but he freaked out during the exam and stormed out. The questions he did answer about Kenny's murder show deception. The first person the police wanted to investigate was Ethan Wosley because something had happened that drew more attention to him. He died by suicide in 2001. In the suicide note, he wrote, I'm sorry for everything. The police thought that this might be admission of guilt. But the police had a problem. They had no idea where Wosley was buried. If he was cremated, they wouldn't be able to get his DNA. Also, he didn't have any children or surviving family, so they couldn't get a DNA sample from a family member. But amazingly, 
the medical examiner had saved the bullet that killed Wasley. DNA was pulled from the bullet and the profile was compared to Kenny's killer's DNA. It was not a match. The police thought the second most promising suspect was David Bowen. In 2005, he was 42 years old. They tracked him down to Portland, Maine, where he worked as a house painter. The problem was that the police didn't have a warrant to get Bowen's DNA. So they asked the Portland police to follow Bowen to see if they could get a sample of his DNA. One day, they thought they saw him toss a cigarette butt out of his truck. They collected it and sent it to the crime lab. It also wasn't a match. The police in Gary, Indiana were shocked. The investigators were basically in two camps. One believed that Ethan Wasley was the killer, and the other thought it was David Bowen. So they were surprised to learn that neither man was the killer. But then they learned that the cigarette butt didn't belong to David. It came from another man in the truck. David Bowen's sister was 20 years old at the time of Kenny's murder. She had long suspected that her brother may have killed Kenny. So she came forward and gave a sample of her DNA. It turned out to be a familial match to the DNA left behind by Kenny's killer. This evidence was enough to get a warrant to collect a DNA sample from David Bowen. In March 2007, Bowen was brought in for questioning. He denied knowing Kenny. But this contradicted what he said in 1979. In 1979, Bowen said that he knew Kenny from the neighborhood who was friends with Tavis Glendez, Kenny's babysitter. The police took a sample of his blood. A DNA profile was built. It was compared to the semen found on the jacket and the skin cells left on the string. It was a match. On December 18, 2007, the police arrested 44-year-old David Bowen 28 years after the murder. He was brought to the police station and he immediately confessed. He said he didn't know why he did it. He said that he encountered Kenny while he was doing his paper route. He lured him into the wooded area and then attacked him. He had planned on sexually assaulting him, but he didn't go through with it. Instead, when Kenny was unconscious, he pleasured himself, which resulted in his semen being left on Kenny's jacket. In September 2008, David Bowen pleaded guilty to murder. A month later, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. At the time of this recording, 59-year-old David Bowen is serving a sentence at the Westville Correctional Facility in Westville, Indiana. His earliest possible release date is January 2032, when he'll be 68 years old. Ten years after Myrna lost her two sons, she got married again. She went on to have a daughter with her new husband. She lived long enough to see her son's killer arrested and convicted. She died in April 2013 at the age of 61. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, if you have a case you want to suggest, please visit our website, criminallylisten.com. Thanks again for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.